So we're off to the races. Thank you for joining me uh, for this uh, Birmingham Tech Week presentation from myself. You know that Birmingham Tech Week is in association with Tech Nation, West Midlands Growth Company, and the DTI. Um, you also know that there are six headline sponsors, um, and there are a number of partners. And Senpai is very pleased, very proud actually, to, to be involved in this today. Now, can I ask you to ensure you're all muted? You look like you are all muted. Um, it's a 45 minute session, but I'm actually allowing uh, about halfway through, I'll pause and allow for the questions. So by all means, please ask questions. Um, and then at the end, I'll also allow for questions. So hang on, there's a, something in the chat box. Okay, good. So um, as I say, 20 to, to 25 minutes, this will be so. Six ways industry 4.0 solutions providers and manufacturing businesses can do business better. I want to make three points today. It's going to be quite an informal session and it's drawn on my experience of the last two and a half, three years working with manufacturers and uh, industry 4.0 solutions providers. The three points are, firstly, a quick state of the nation in terms of industry 4.0. Secondly, why is better needed? with three small case studies of actual interactions between manufacturers and um, uh, vendors. And thirdly, six ways to do better. And the better, again, refers to the, uh, the title of this presentation. Before I do, a quick thing about me, uh, how I spend my days, spent my days really. Um, so, uh, hang on. So this is, uh, this is our business, Senpai. Uh, you can see myself and my co-founder there. I'm not gonna wax lyrical about this. If you want to know more of the kind of things we can do, it's their circle for you. Um, you'll see that uh, the way that kind of work I do and have been doing, large multinational businesses, billion pound turnover plus down to small businesses, um, things like uh, helping them, JCB in this case, set up their Lean Academy, for their global uh, training, helping them with their OPEX strategy, going from uh, my scribbling in my book all the way to bringing that to fruition. Doing the same with Denso, part of Toyota Group, helping them set up their uh, Lean Academy, defining what it should do and how it should work, and actually setting it up. I also spend my time uh, doing things like, excuse me a second, I keep getting a beeping here. Okay. So, um, I also spend my time helping people um, on shop floors, probably the most enjoyable part. In this case, I'm watching a change over here, uh, trying to improve it. And here is another uh, example of what I do. That's Sam, he's an MD, and we did some work on his shop floor, of which, as you can see, he's quite pleased. I work with teams to improve the way their management systems work, quite often scribbling on whiteboards, I train people directly and I coach other people to coach people who work for them. So on the right there is Jim. Jim is a cell leader, group leader for manufacturer. Sonny there is at the board, he's a team leader. And I coach Jim to coach Sonny so that there is a cascade of knowledge. It's not all just manufacturing. There is some uh, non-production stuff. This is value stream mapping, working with a designer team. I write articles. I've written a book and there's another book if I ever get to finishing it. And I do judging for the manufacturer TMMX awards amongst other things. Occasionally I, I'm lucky and I get to uh, a client because they've had successes in terms of lean transformation. Uh, I get to go to, to Japan to be with the team who received the prize for the uh, best global company. Um, I do conference speaking and every two or three years I go to Japan or China to spend time with my sensei, um, Mick Sam here, Toshiyuki Maroka, who uh, is never afraid to give me a kidney punch to uh, uh, bring, bring my learning on. So that's me. That's all I'm gonna talk about in terms of senpai. Now onto the guts of this. That's my background. What my background isn't, is I'm not a tech expert in terms of AR, VR, AI, big data, any of that. But by accident, by default, I've fallen into a kind of translator role. Now, I struggle with that definition, actually. Um, and by translator, I mean, in helping three of my clients bring in 10 different uh, types of industry 4.0 vendors, 
I've had to become the go-between to interpret what the, manuf what the manufacturer wants and is saying and what the provider can provide, hence the reason for this session. I have no particular dog in this race, and by dog I mean the manufacturers, all the vendors, the solutions providers. I actually need, we need both dogs uh, to prosper and win because uh, UK's productivity issue where we fall into ninth in the world, it will only be solved if we can all work better together. What I am is a fundamental believer that Industry 4.0, any kind of automation or investment of that type, it should be done where you should, not where you can. And I'll come back to that later. Um, so a quick state of the nation for Industry 4.0. I'm not going to walk you through the steam, through to electricity, through to PLCs, and the fact that we're in the fourth industrial revolution. You haven't turned up today for that history lesson. And I'm assuming if you're here, you know that we're in the fourth industrial revolution. Um, what I do want to do is talk about how I think it's going uh, from my own experience. I'll start by asking what's in an inconsistent name. So, um, in this case, uh, if you look globally, everybody is talking about Industry 4.0, but if you sh just scan your eyes across this map, there's any number of different names for it. There's a different lexicon popping up all around the world. Even if you zoom into Europe with the rest of the world on the fringes, still a lot of different names. And even closer, a lot of different names. Now, it's no problem because it's relatively new, relatively and it will coalesce towards a standard language. But it worries me a little bit because we're moving. It's a bit like when I used to work for an, uh, an aerospace business that made landing gear, titanium forgings. People refer to a pork chop. Um, uh, and I never knew what a pork chop was until I found out it was a certain type of articulation link. And the, it's very important for us to establish a common language over time. Hopefully this will coalesce together. What I will say is that what I'm going to talk to you about today is based on my travels. So this is the blurb, the advertising for this session. If you look at this bit here, cobots, augmented reality, big data, AI, eye tracking, et cetera. Three clients, three of my clients and 10 or so of these companies have come in and I've introduced them. And what I'm talking about today is, is drawn from those interactions. It's also drawn from two trips I made to Japan uh, over the last uh, year and a half to see what Toyota Group in particular are doing specifically in terms of Industry 4.0. Finally, it's drawn from my own work. Uh, Senpai as a business, we are working on a lean learning platform currently. So we're having to work out how to work with uh, digital suppliers ourselves as a business. So. First off then, Industry 4.0. Now, let me just check something quickly that I can get chat up, okay. Um, categories helping or hindering. So, these are the categories that are often shouted out for the types of Industry 4.0 solutions. Now, it's a natural thing to categorize and it, it's okay because it's helpful for manufacturers to know where to search and it's helpful for vendors to know where to position themselves. The limitation of categorizing in this way is that it tells you what the business does, not what the solution will provide for you. So AR, VR or uh, wearables suppliers, they need to go beyond this pure categorization and go for a smarter approach. And I've seen two smarter approaches, one from the vendor side and one from the manufacturer side. The vendor side is that rather than talking about features, they effectively talk about benefits. Worker safety, no mistakes, zero defects, independent training, remote training, accessible information quickly. What can it do for you, for example? From a manufacturer side, rather than asking an AR, VR supplier to come in or a supplier of a certain uh, tool, some of the smart ones are thinking of this in terms of a numerator, uh, denominator, and equation. And they're thinking, right, how am I going to engage with Industry 
I'm a numerator. I want to improve my, my, the way my equipment works. Oh, could you mute, please? Sorry. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, I need to improve the way uh, my equipment works. Increased uptime, uh, increased quality performance, increased productivity. So the focus on the machine in the numerator. On the denominator, I need to improve human work, reduce the amount of non-value added wasteful time and improve the way that uh, our people work to make full benefit of their capabilities. Now within, and the aim of course, is to uh, improve the equipment work this way, improve the human work that way, and in affecting both the numerator and the denominator, you get a very big benefit in terms of uh, the way the business performs, productivity, SQDCP. More specifically, the top half, the numerator, they're thinking, right, equipment, what do I need? Well, I need to be able to predict problems faster. I need to be able to find symptoms of things going wrong finding trouble early. And on the bottom half, I need to engage with anything that helps me to eliminate low value added work and reduce variation in standardized work, for example. Now, both of them, top and bottom, uh, are, uh, are improved by the ability to visualize issues better. And if we can leverage Industry 4.0 to identify the next Kaizen. Now, that there, a manufacturer viewing industry 4.0 opportunities or digital manufacturing opportunities in that way it means that they are going to be thinking how can whatever you're providing as a vendor help me solve one of these problems rather than ooh, let's give that a go it looks interesting or it looks shiny so state the nation still who's trying to help us uh, to forge a stronger path to industry 4.0 well the government is trying to do its bit and has been for a while uh, the Made Smarter initiative is very good, over £100 million, pounds, the Northwest pilot. It'd be nice if it was rolled out faster, but understand the need to prove a pilot. Innovate UK were doing uh, things before COVID and they've stepped up since COVID, so they're, they're making waves. The manufacturer, not a government body, with their digital manufacturing week, has really, really honed and improved over the last uh, four years that, that, that I've been involved with it. Um, to the point where, by the way, if you don't read the manufacturer magazine, um, I'm not on commission it, if you don't read it, then, then you're losing opportunity here because they've recently become very focused on industry 4.0 and digital manufacturing, very strong. And Make UK with their national manufacturing conference and some of the work they're trying to do with Ingenuity as well. These are the people that are trying to help. What I would say though, is that you pretty much have to find your own way. Uh, the government is in it, recognises the need, seems to be based more on a fear of missing out globally, productivity-wise. Um, the industrial strategy is forming, there have been some movements, people like Jürgen Meyer are doing some good work, but it's inconsistent. So, my summary, before I move on to the, uh, to the real need today. My summary is, yes, it's gaining traction. From a buyer-manufacturer perspective, though, Still digitally very in, immature, talking a better game now, but still don't really understand the possibilities. And some of that will be because the people making decisions, the, the, the higher echelons of manufacturing businesses, your ops directors, MD, they are learning to be digital savvy rather than uh, being it from, from school age. There's uncertainty about the ROI impact, and I'll come back to this. Um, I think it's incumbent on vendors to be able to show manufacturers what the ROI is going to be, particularly those internally who have to sell upwards, engineers, ops people. They're unclear on the possibilities. Um, it's, hard to, it's hard for manufacturers to form an image of what could be done because they don't understand the full range of possibilities and how these technologies link up. And how to start is a point of fear for them. How to try this stuff in a proof of concept, low risk, okay to fail way without building white elephants or sinking a load of cash into something that's just not gonna work. So they're waiting to be led. Led by vendors. And I want vendors to lead better. At the moment, 
most of the vendors I see are still solutions providers, not problem lovers. They want to sell, sell their very good shiny baubles rather than fall in love with the problem and then match back to how and if they can help. Also, the shop floor sensitivity of vendors is not good. By shop floor sensitivity, I mean the ability to comfortably walk a shop floor, ask the right questions, and have some diagnosis ability and understand the type of process, the type of product, and lead the buyer, the manufacturer. I would say it's meh, and meh there, currently the skill level. All in all, it has a wild west feel at the moment. Um, the solutions providers who are good at selling are doing well in the short term, but I think longer term there's going to be uh, a need for a different type of skill. I'll come back to that. My conclusion, it's a bit like my son's favorite restaurant, Cosmo. You may have a Cosmo near you. It's cuisines of the world, the world buffet. You pay your 15 quid and uh, you can fill your boots um, with cuisines from all around the world. China, Korea, Italy, etc. The risk of that is that you end up an hour and a half later staggering out of Cosmos with a bit of a stomach ache. And I see Industry 4.0 adoption a bit like that currently. People are dabbling, they're trying stuff, and they're going to end up with a metaphorical stomach ache because nothing is ever tried in a sensible, low cost proof of concept way. I can't say nothing is ever, quite often, I mean. So, we do well as both manufacturers and vendors to remember what the key barriers are to industry for adoption currently. And I've put this on his side because it's hard to read the other way. The top four are cybersecurity, lack of technical skills to design new systems and implement, lack of certainty of solution working, and finding the right partners. Finding the right partners is one of the top four barriers. So that's how I see Industry 4 as it currently stands. Now I want to talk about why is better needed, the better in the title. And I want to go through it with three case studies. And I want to frame it from the first meeting. So this is the meeting where the vendor or solutions provider comes in and starts talking to somebody in the manufacturing business. First case is augmented reality, virtual reality. Um, and in this case, the company who came in, they followed the classic, I'll do a bit of pre-work, uh, I'll do a show and tell of our particular solution in a conference room with a coffee, and everybody, and, and then we'll do a walk and talk, um, and I'll try to make what I see fit to our particular solution. Now, in this case, and I'm not gonna name these, these, uh, these companies because it's, it's just not fair, everybody's learning. Um, in this case, the pre-work was done, but it was coming for a cursory chat. There wasn't on the phone an exploration of a specific issue. The show and tell, uh, there was a very cursory conversation about tell us what your problems are broadly, and then it quickly moved into a sales mode, look at what we can do. Um, once that bit was done in the, in the conference room, we then moved on to a walk and talk. Now the walk and talk was my suggestion. And it took, uh, it wasn't something that the AR VR company rep, like a technical salesperson was particularly comfortable with. So there was a hesitant, yeah, yeah, we can do that. Then we walked and we talked and you could see throughout the shop floor, they were uncomfortable. Not used to being on the shop floor, they were on the back foot and they were hunting and searching, trying to make an impact um, and then at the end, there was a quick wrap up where there was a scramble from the ARVR side to make it fit. But, but by that point, they lost it because the walk and talk hadn't shown sufficient understanding or empathy for the process or problems. So that one didn't work well. And in my opinion, that whole structure of do your pre-work do your pre-qualifying on the phone or by email, then show and tell in a conference room, then walk and talk. It just doesn't work. Uh, it's not sensible. This is my proposed and my preferred route that I now uh, request suppliers to, to use. Pre-work, yes. Strong pre-work with a walk, an initial walk. So almost as soon as you come in after the greetings and uh, 
nice to meet you is let's go and have a walk and let's walk and as we walk uh, try to understand more about the process and the product at a uh, high level and ask to go to the point of need why have you called me today what kind of processes products are troubling you and then the brave bit a vendor has to be prepared to stand on the shop floor in a safe place and observe for four five six seven minutes and ask specific questions of the area that you're observing which by the way you've qualified is a is a problem area to truly understand what the problem is then you go into the conference room you have your coffee and you show and tell and by the by when you show and tell um you uh you can show and tell in relation to what you've seen to explore how you solve the problem so that's my preferred route so let's move on to the second case study, an artificial intelligence business. They had a very, very strong piece of uh, software and an approach that, excuse me, would help manufacturing businesses with very detailed, complex bombs, complex routings, um, bombs are bit of materials, complex routings to schedule their shop better. Now, um, uh, in this case, they, they followed this route they came in, they did their pre-work. They asked questions on the phone, the right kind of questions. They came around the shop and did a walk and talk. The failure was on the walk and talk. There were general questions uh, to try to show interest, I think, rather than trying to get to the nub of what the problems are. They didn't stand and observe. And on the shop, critically, they hadn't understood or grasped the complexity of that particular shop floor. It was a business that had 50 mold machines and any number of tools, maybe 150, no, actually more, three to 400 mold tools. When they came back into the conference room to then talk afterwards, um, they, uh, on the show and tell, the whole thing unraveled because they hadn't grasped the complexity. So they didn't understand that there were sometimes two impression tools, sometimes one plus one, sometimes there were inserts. So there was a whole nother layer of complexity beyond just a machine and a tool. Why did this matter? Because my, my manufacturing clients sat next to me couldn't get past the fact that they hadn't grasped how the process and product worked. So I halted the presentation. The reason for that is that it's very tricky if you're trying to sell a solution across multiple industries and you don't have a grasp of different types of processes and products and sectors, you're going to miss something. And interestingly, that business has now chosen to focus on that AI business. It's focusing on one very narrow sector where they can deeply understand the problems and the pain. It's probably a shrewd move. The third case, and this is a positive case, so I'm going to name this company. Um, they did the pre-work very well, good qualifying questions, tell me specifics. They did the walk and the ask, and they even stood and observed, and they were comfortable doing so. They had spent time on shop floors. If you've ever seen a politician uh, on a shop floor in a high-vis vest, you'll recognize what comfortable and uncomfortable looks like. They, they did the show and tell, and they'd, they'd uh, factored their show and tell, they created it in such a way that they could quickly adapt it to something they'd seen on the shop floor. It's a quick demonstration. And this company, it's, it's a company called Toby Pro, Swedish company. Uh, I'm not going to push them too hard here. In the interest of disclosure, they did well here. I have a commercial relationship with them, but uh, I'm not being paid by them for this. I, I, I just like, like to name good companies. So in summary then, I don't like the left. I like the right because I think it works and I've seen manufacturers prosper from that and I've seen vendors get business and start to form partnerships from that. Next. Uh, right, I'm gonna ask questions so far, but I'm not entirely sure I can pull up the questions anyway. So give me just a second to see if I can pull them up. And if I can't pull them up quickly, I won't pull them up at all. I'm sorry, I can't pull the questions up. Um, I'll have another go at the end. Apologies for that. Uh, I will get to the questions at the end. And if for some reason I don't get to the questions, um, if I can't pull them up, I will answer all of the questions afterwards. 
So, third thing then, we've done state the nation, we've done why is better needed. Now six ways to do better. And this is what I talked about in the title. From a vendor side or a solution provider, number one, be a doctor, not a pharmacist. As vendors, we need you to, to stop taking the, what do you want? Yep, we can do that approach. The best use of your expertise is to diagnose. It's not to act like a pharmacist, just, uh, I say just, pharmacists do a very good job, but providing medicine to a prescription that somebody else provides. Vendors have to become the doctor to diagnose the pain um, because that's where the value added is. That's where you, that's where you uh, develop a partnership. The second way for vendors to become better at working with manufacturers is to love their problems way more than your solutions. However wedded you are to the beauty of your product and no mother has an ugly baby, please put that to one side and structure your interaction so that you understand the problems that, people, that manufacturers have before you get into your solutions. Don't make it fit, work out how you can solve the problem. And the third way, is copy and paste is your enemy. I have a visceral dislike of copy and paste. It's lazy thinking, both in lean, my background, and in uh, solutions providers. Copy and paste means that, oh, I saw something similar in a different manufacturing company. We'll just re uh, repackage the presentation and give them that. People can spot that a mile off. Copy and paste doesn't work because Every manufacturing business, there are similarities and there are similar problems, but every manufacturing business has a different level of capability, has different fires burning, is at a different level of maturity, and you have to grasp that. Solution to all of these, don't just answer an email asking you as a vendor to come on site. Uh, qualify that there's uh, something tangible to show you on the shop floor. It's not just say, hey, I'm vaguely interested in this. Um, but to tell you about the pain or the gain they've got um, and once in understand the product and process uh, that they have in fact I go further than this vendors somebody in your business needs to understand the different types of manufacturing process from uh, repetitive discrete job shop continuous process they need to understand that there are four or five different factory layouts that have different problems the IAVT layouts so um, please don't just go into a uh, to a, uh, a request to have a chat. Specifically for vendors, consider when you're in the first meeting onwards, who are you talking to? What's their position? Engineer, operations, um, the MD. What are their biases? What are their reasons for bringing you in? Operations generally want their pain eased. Engineers want a decent, robust, rapid solution because they are tied up both trying to improve mature processes that have problems and MPI work. So understand what the biases are. Understand whether this manufacturing business is worried about pain or gain. Are they hurting safety, quality, delivery, cost and people, a productivity issue, or are they after a gain? They want competitive advantage in some way. And always trust your eyes over your ears. You'll generally find walking around with people who run factories. There are three mismatches between what they're telling you and the reality in front of them. One is, and it says honesty here, it's, it's, not a, it's not people wanting to deceive, but it's people being cagey. What they tell you and what's the truth are very different things. Uh, they may be a bit embarrassed about certain things, or they may be wanting to protect their IP, or they may just not be being entirely honest um, because it doesn't reflect well on them. There's another mismatch, which is for those people in manufacturing companies, operations, uh, manufacturing managers who like to try and run the shop floor from their chair, their closeness to the shop isn't strong. So uh, what they, what they uh, believe to be the issue may not actually be the issue. So if you can find some way to filter whether you're the person standing in front of you spends a lot of time on the shop or not, then you'll know how to um, take what they tell you and finally of course we all have blind spots 
So there is a blindness to what people perceive. They may not perceive the true problem. They may perceive a symptom of a problem. So train your eyes as a vendor and trust your eyes over your ears. Understand the process flow, product types and complexity. And I've talked about that briefly. As you're walking around, take a look and try to do some rough maths on machine versus people density. Recognize the areas, recognize the condition, the age uh, of, the, uh, of the machines and recognize the, if it's people density, what kind of stuff are they doing? How can my solution help depending on what kind of vendor you are? Also, uh, from a quality perspective, take a feel for whether there's a human assurance bias or a physical assurance bias. What this means in simple language is, do they rely on people to try and either build in quality or catch uh, bad stuff before it goes out? Or do they have jigs, error proofing uh, built onto the process? Trust the visual cues that you see. There are any number of visual cues that will help you to understand and diagnose the issues. And finally, when you see something on the shop floor as a vendor as you're walking around, um, that, that you can help with, cast your eyes either side and see if there's a Yokoten benefit. Yokoten is a Japanese word meaning uh, copy across, bridge across. So if there are eight assembly lines and you can see an issue on one, the question is, could the company get a benefit on the other, the other seven as well? So look for the Yokoten opportunity. Manufacturers, um, three relationship problems here. From your side, please be clear about why you called them. This is like the flip side of number one for the uh, vendors. Um, be specific about the SQDCP issues you have and why they're in there. And if you, if you are wanting to try something, run an experiment of some kind, frame it really specifically, not uh, mm, we're not sure if AR will help in maintenance. That's a very wide uh, framing of a problem and it relies on a vendor to interpret that correctly. A better framing of a problem is, will augmented reality help us to solve maintenance skills uh, problems on our tricky coiling machines to reduce lost time on these machines? Now, that's a very well-framed problem that will take you to a certain part of the shop and will enable the vendor to really diagnose uh, well, to help. Number five is linked to number four, open the kimono. Uh, I apologize for the Japanese influences here. I spent a lot of time around Japanese businesses. What this means is as a manufacturer, you have to let the um, vendor in, tell them what's wrong, don't uh, hide your problems. Problems are treasures, so open the kimono a little. Um, and sure you've got IP to correct, to, to protect here, but they are not going to be gifted enough to try to get past uh, your vagueness. You're going to have to point to stuff. And finally, it's our responsibility. I say our, uh, it's manufacturer's responsibility, I believe, to teach vendors how to be good industry 4.0 vendors. And we do that by demanding a certain approach. So when I showed the, the two ways of running the first meeting earlier, demand the second way um, in the nicest possible way, but structure it a certain way and show them what you expect. Be demanding because um, uh, vendors won't, won't mind that. They, they, they'll prefer a specific thing to a vague thing. It helps them. Final point for manufacturers, and I've only got about five minutes left. What would Taiji Ono do? Now, Taiji Ono was the architect of the Toyota production system. And when he was asked time after time after time, where should we start? What should be our first point to try and improve? His answer was always the same. Start at the point of greatest need. Which comes back to what is the problem we're trying to solve? Not what can I try in terms of industry 4.0? So, uh, final point, look in the future. What capabilities do I believe manufacturers and uh, solutions providers, vendors need to develop? Well, firstly, some lean thinking. I would say this because I'm a lean thinking person. 
but the ability to understand the current state and diagnose the weakness and the opportunity. The diagnostic ability is really important, of course, that, that final part I said, the ability to say, yep, yeah, so we agree there's a gap there, gap there, gap there, gap there, and we'd like to tackle them in this sequence because that's the best way of doing it. Road mapping. Um, some of the hesitancy I see from manufacturing clients is that they'd be happy to try something, industry 4.0, but they worry about a white elephant or a cul-de-sac. They worry about trying it and then it's a limited benefit. So the ability for a provider to be able to say, right, this may be step one, but judging on what we've seen in your business um, and even doing a diagnostic a day, day and a half, we believe it could be here to here to here to here. And this first step is very unlikely to give you an issue. And finally, lean startup thinking. Embrace lean startup thinking, both from manufacturer and vendor side. And by this, I mean the, the Eric Ries work based on uh, a classic lean thinking. Be prepared to run very, very low cost, uh, happy to fail, low risk proof of concepts, and then prototypes that uh, prove that whatever you want to do has legs. And then uh, you move into MVP and then roadmap. That proof of concept prototyping is really important to run small, well-framed experiments. Final thoughts, final slide this. So, in terms of vendors, collaborate. Uh, I like Brewdog beer, um, and uh, in fact, I'm a shareholder. And if you look at the Brewdog board and any of their bars, left-hand side is Brewdog, right-hand side is other breweries. They know that they are strengthened by being able to offer a range of quality beers, not all of which they brew themselves. So some strategic partnerships with other types of industry four providers would be really useful, I think, um, to be able, because it cuts down the need for the manufacturer to go to many places, to talk to people in many different businesses, different uh, vendors. So the right kind of collaboration of complementary, not competitive products. Secondly, de-risk. If vendors embrace the de-risking, um, our manufacturers, the lean startup principle of running a proof of concept <clears throat> tightly framed, and if manufacturers do the same, you can de-risk it very early at a very low cost. And if you're a vendor, I think this is a key question for industry 4.0 vendors. Are you in the business of planting nice plants, improving the soil, or improving the skills of the gardener. This is our allotment. That's my wife there peering at the uh, at, at the veg. If you're in the, the business of plants, you are in the business of not worrying about the soil, not worrying about the gardener's skill, just putting in a solution that may be a very fine piece of tech that may not flourish. If you're interested in the soil, that's a step forward. You're interested in um, uh, how do I cultivate the right uh, conditions for our kind of solution to flourish. If you're interested in the gardener as well as the soil, now you're really singing because you start to create a business model and, and a number are doing this. You start to create a business model where your interest is in increasing the capability internally to be able to replicate what you showed through licensed products, whatever. Fundamentally, this is my last point, I think, uh, the foundation of all of this is make good people to make good things. Industry 4.0 is not about taking people out of the equation. Uh, light soft manufacturing has been tried. You end up swapping one set of problems for another. Automation tech is a good thing where you should, not just where you can. So that's everything I have to say. That's uh, that's the 45 minutes. Um, I'm going to try and find the questions now. And apologies if I can't find them. I'll stop screen sharing for a moment. Now here's the questions. Okay. So uh, okay. Question one from Dell. Uh, Dell one. 
Tech Week is online and only there is a nowhere to attend. Okay, so Tech Week is just on, online, yes. And then I have a question on, do Chinese and Japanese have similar business processes? As you deal both of them, can I assume you can share some insights on observations on two different countries in Asia and who seems very ambitious in Industry 4.0? Okay, so uh, I spent in total three to four weeks in China and I've been to Japan four times in the last four years. Um, primarily I've worked in Japan and the Japanese companies I've been in have been at the higher end. Um, it's been your Toyotas, your Lexuses, your Denzos. So what I see is probably the top end, and I know Mazda are doing a lot of work. Um, they are thinking very hard about how to use Industry 4.0 sensibly. Um, uh, primarily because the kind of businesses I'm talking about there have a lot of stability, so they have a good basis in place. The Chinese businesses I've seen, by definition of the places I went, they were lower performing businesses. So they were not particularly looking at industry 4.0 and not looking sensibly when they were looking. But don't take that as a China-Japan uh, split. That's just based on my, my experience. Um, from Chris Garbett, uh, from a vendor POV, when speaking with prospects who are moving away, old bespoke software is created for their needs. How can we better value sell a generalized MRP software? Blimey, that's a specific, um, that's a specific uh, question. Tell you what, Chris, contact me offline, but what I will say, I would like to say something um, about legacy systems. Now, uh, I spent a little bit of time learning about low code, no code, which I think is a fabulous thing. Um, and what I have, Found from a couple of my clients is that, um, and they are big names that, that you'll know, the business is run on Excel. Excel to plug holes in legacy systems that don't quite talk to each other. That need to use Excel, uh, where citizen developers have sprung up, small macro experts have sprung up in businesses who are running Excel to plug the gaps between legacy systems, that is the place to start. Behind this tools thing, there is a whole MES part, part to this equation. Okay, so uh, that's it for questions, I think. Yep, if, if there are any more questions, please shout up now. Failing that, thank you very much. And uh, I hope it was useful. Uh, the final slide there has my um, contact details on. If you'd like to contact me, please, by all means do. Um, and good luck. Enjoy the rest of Birmingham Tech Week. Thank you.